Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevins Welder. There's a popular practice among Christians to confess their sins to each other or before the congregation. And the question is, is this right? Is this biblical? I mean, we've seen this thing uh, in books. Sometimes you read about an, in somebody's autobiography that uh, they had confessed their sins publicly. You hear about it in uh, charismatic what they call revival meetings. Uh, it's a practice in the walk to Emmaus or the walk to Damascus or Acts or whatever they call it now. And even in some fundamental churches, we've heard of this practice. This was also touted in Rick Warren's book on the Purpose Driven Church. Uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, people are confessing their sins to each other in those forums and other forums as well, like group counseling sessions and even in AA meetings. And no matter the circumstances, this practice of confessing your sins publicly is ungodly. And for Christians, it should be avoided like the plague. The root of this practice or the root desire is sensuality. It's a quest for greater or deeper spirituality. Unloading your trash on others gives you the sensation that your burdens have been lifted, that somehow now you have a power over your sins that you didn't have before. It also gives you the appearance of being very spiritual, and it also gives you the appearance of being a humble Christian if it's done in church or done by a Christian. And truly, the feeling, that sensuality, that sense of the lifted burden is nothing more than a counterfeit of the freedom that you already have in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's John chapter 8, verse 32 and verse 36. Uh, Jesus Christ tells us to come to him. And you get that feeling that somehow the yoke of Jesus Christ is, is lighter than your own yoke. Uh, the Bible says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, those three verses are true. And you truly do have a rest in Jesus Christ, and you truly do have a lighter yoke and a lighter burden in Jesus Christ. But what happens is that Christians get the idea, because they're carrying the burden of this sin themselves, that if they dump it on others, that yoke is going to lighten, and that burden is going to lighten, and that there's going to be the feeling of rest. That rest that you have in Jesus Christ is not a feeling, necessarily. It's certainly an easier yoke and a lighter burden and the relief of stress. But it's not the same thing as this lifting, uh, this transfer, this, this elation, this sensuality that comes from this open confession. I mean, truly, truly, if you think about it, the, the humility you hope to demonstrate by telling others your sins is not a humility at all. It's actually pride. And instead of reviving your spirit, it revives your old man. It brings up the past. You know what it is? It's simply an opportunity for the old man to become, listen, comfortable with the sins of his past. Or it's an opportunity for the old man in a, in a forum of other people to deal with the sins of his past. 
you know, every Christian that has any kind of past at all is going to, from time to time, uh, reflect on his past with regret. I mean, some to a greater degree, some to a lesser degree than others. But nevertheless, it comes up from time to time. You may see somebody, it reminds you that, boy, that's the road I went down. And, uh, and some people get caught in this trap where they just go round and round and round and can't seem to get off the merry-go-round of feeling guilty and shamed by their past. And so they think, well, since nothing else is working, perhaps what I need to do is just openly confess this to others, and you don't need to go down that road. You have all the liberty you need in Jesus Christ. You have all the rest you need in, in Jesus Christ. Now, the reason people are even prompted to tell others their sins in the first place is that they fail to believe God's words concerning their sins and His forgiveness. And this is very important. Uh, if you believe what you're getting ready to hear, if you believe what God said, uh, if you reflect on the sins of your past, you don't have to dwell on them. You can just acknowledge, yeah, okay, that happened, and, and, and quit thinking about it. Because when you come to Christ, all of your sins are gone, past, present, and future. The Bible tells you where they are. They're taken away. In John chapter 1, verse 29, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus Christ to uh, Israel, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Did you hear that? Your sins have been taken away by Jesus Christ. And, and that's because those sins were actually laid on the Lord. And He is the one that died for them. They're under his blood. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says, In whom we have forgiveness, even the redemption through his blood. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14, he tells you what he did with your sins. I didn't quote the verse entirely. Listen, listen. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Watch it. Even the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven, and they are under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been redeemed through His blood. You're washed. Now, the Lord says to Israel some other things about sins, and I want to look at those because they give you a picture of how God treated sins there in the Old Testament before the cross, and what he's done with them in the New Testament so that you get the understanding. God doesn't want you to be concerned about your sin and the sins of your past anymore. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17. The Bible says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. Watch it, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Now, when sins go behind the back of the Lord, he can't see them. And that's because he chooses not to turn around to look at them. In Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, you know where, you know where the sins are? According to the Bible, they're in the depths of the sea. Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says, He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Do you understand when the Lord puts them behind his back and in the depths of the sea and under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and takes them away because of what Christ did for us and then removes them, as the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. They're gone. They're gone. You say, yeah, but I'm still feeling bad about those. That's right. And, and that feeling is a reminder not to go there again. And that feeling is a regret. But when it becomes powerful and you think in order to, 
to eliminate this feeling, I've got to dump this trash on somebody else. That means you're going behind God's back to pull that stuff out. You're going into the depths of the sea to dig it up. You're going as far as the east is from the west to find it again. You're removing it out from under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, taking it off of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and presenting it in public for what purpose? You see, if you really believe what God said, you can just forget it. That's what he's done. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, the Bible says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And that's not because God can't remember them. He just chooses not to remember them. So why should you? He's the one that paid for them. The transgressions were against him. If he's chosen to forget them, why don't you? You see, there's power in what God has already done for you. People say, well, I've got to go find a higher power to give me the power to get done with this. You can't find a power higher than God Almighty. You can't find a power greater than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth and had resurrected from the dead, he said something about power to his disciples. And you ought to believe what he said. He said in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So you need a higher power? There it is right there. Jesus Christ, I remember years ago, after a radio broadcast, the telephone rang at the church. I answered it, and there was a fellow that lived in our listening area. And he said, I want to tell you something. I've been battling with dr a drug addiction in my life, and I've been listening to your radio broadcast and reading the Bible. And I'm saved. Now... And he said, you know, for years I tried to get help from a higher power. I was going to AA meetings and trying to get help from a higher power, confessing my sins. And I, I just wasn't, it wasn't working. I kept going back to these drugs. But he said, when I found out that the higher power, the true higher power is Jesus Christ, and I got him on the inside, he said, I want to tell you business picked up in town. You know what he said? I have victory now over those sins. You see, that's what you really want. And, and if you still feel bad about the past, well, then, you know, either learn not to feel bad about it anymore or feel bad about it, but don't, don't dwell in the pit. Just give yourself a few minutes to say, boy, that sure was bad, and then get your mind off that and go back into what Jesus Christ said. That's what he wants you to do. Listen, when God removes your sins and forgives you, he fixes you up as a new man. And when you are a new man, you know that new man didn't sin those sins of the old man. The old man is, is dead in Christ. The new man is alive in Christ. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. Now that new man didn't commit those things that are plaguing you. You're a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all, th all things are become new. You no longer depend upon your own righteousness. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You know what you have now? You have God's righteousness. The Bible says that God made Jesus Christ to be sin for us. So if your sin was adultery, God made Jesus Christ an adulterer to, to, to take the punishment for the adultery you committed. And then, and then he didn't stop with that. The Bible says God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, that's you and me, might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he took away your sins and he gave you his righteousness. And as a result of that, your life has completely changed. I'm going to show you some verses here that will show you you are washed, sanctified, justified, forgiven, purged, and free. <laughs> you, you know, I'm sure, I am sure that this, this mental plague of, of emotion that bothers you about your past is simply a failure to believe what God said in the Bible about your past and about your sins. You're washed. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, 
that you're washed. But look at the context in verses 9 and 10. Know you not, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. You ever done that before? Nor idolaters. You ever done that before? Nor adulterers. Was that you? Nor effeminate. Is that in your past? Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Have you been responsible for that? Nor thieves. How about that? Nor covetous. How was that? Nor drunkards. Was that you? Nor revilers. If you had a problem with that. Nor extortioners. Is that what you did? Shall inherit the kingdom of God. Watch it. And such were some of you. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You, and you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when the Spirit of God came into your life, instantly you were washed, sanctified, and justified. Now, we know what it means to be washed. The old sins were, were cleaned out. And to be sanctified means that God then set you apart from your sin so that He could use you and have fellowship with you. And to be justified means that at that moment God tried you in his court of justice and his court of mercy and found you not guilty. You're not guilty. Those things are done. They're gone. They're, 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 they're been removed. And you're forgiven. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. God has enough grace and mercy to say, you know what? Bad stuff you did, but I forgive you. Now, why would you go tell a group? Why would you go confess your sins to somebody else like a priest? Why would you do that? Because you say, well, I don't feel like I'm forgiven yet. I heard what you said. You said, I don't feel like I'm forgiven yet. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a fact. And God said, you're forgiven. You say, well, I feel bad about what I did. Okay. Quit feeling bad. You're a new creature now. That's in the past. I've noticed something. When people make themselves feel bad about and regret about their past, you know what they do? They go right back and do the same thing again that they did. That's where that feeling leads. So why would you go there? L let, me, let me just describe for you feelings, okay, so you understand. Um. Bear with me just a minute. I had shoulder surgery, and so before the surgery, I had to have an MRI, and they stuffed me into a, a thermos, you know, the tube for the MRI. Oh, I, I had the misfortune of opening my eyes once I got in there, and I saw that that I was oh, that I was stuffed in this tube. And I'm going to tell you something, man. That that claustrophobia hit me. And there was something that raged through my body. There was a feeling of panic and fear. I hit that panic button. They pulled me out of there and they asked me, are you claustrophobic? I said, I didn't think I was, but I found out I am now. And they said, what are you going to do? You want to go to a different machine that's bigger? I said, you know what? Give me, give me some minutes here. And so I uh, let the panic subside. I got a damp cloth and put it on my head. I covered my eyes. I lay back down and I after a few minutes regained my composure and I began to pray and I told the technician I said put me back in there but this time I'll tell you what I did I I completely imagined myself in uh, on a mountain <laughs> and I and I sang hymns to you know to, silently to myself and prayed but I'm gonna tell you something that feeling of panic and claustrophobia never came back in there I was enjoying such good fellowship with God Almighty that that the 20 minutes that I was in there for the MRI passed like five, and I was surprised when they pulled me back out of there. What am I trying to tell you? Feelings, emotions are things that can be controlled. And you don't need to go tell a bunch of people your sordid past, and you don't need uh, to dwell on that. You just start having fellowship with God and, and singing to the Lord and praying to the Lord and believing what He said, and that that feeling will go away. You're purged. The Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who offered himself without spot, 
to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see that conscience that's troubling you? When you apply the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to your conscience, it clears. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's what you need to do. You're free. You're free. He that is dead is freed from sin. You see, the wisdom behind telling others your sins is, according to James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. Have you ever read about that type of wisdom in James chapter 3? In James chapter 3, the Bible says, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. That's what you've been doing. You've been lying against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. Men cooked it up down here. Sensual, because it has a feeling associated with it. And devilish, they got it from the devil, not from God. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. In other words, in other words, when you, when you get other people to start listening to your stuff, there's bitterness that comes in, there's envy that comes in, strife, confusion, and evil work. That's right. I know in, in a church, they adapt, adopted, I, there's many stories on this. I just remember one right now that uh, they adopted this idea of confessing your sins, you know, in, in groups to get power on it. That's what Rick Warren suggested. They followed that advice. So if the blood of Jesus Christ won't do it, tell it to your friends and establish some accountability. That'll keep you away from those sins. And so a deacon confessed to a, a man's wife that was in that group that he had been lusting after her. Well, she didn't know that he found her attractive. And by telling her that, you know what she, <laughs> they got hooked up. They did. They both divorced their spouses in time and got married. And she wouldn't have known that if he hadn't spilled the beans right there in that group. Instead of following what you've been listening to in, in the Bible on this broadcast. I'm telling you, the stuff is poison. Listen, if God has washed, sanctified, justified, forgiven, purged, and freed you, then what benefit could possibly be derived from telling somebody else what God has already forgiven, forgotten, and cleared? Nothing can come from it but a feeling and embarrassment eventually that's right listen the people who hear this about you they're not going to forget like god has god can and chooses to forget people don't forget they look at you and they think oh that's that fellow that yeah they look at you and they oh yeah that's she oh yeah i sure remember what she did oh yeah you know, people delight in that kind of sordid stuff I mean, you just watch TV. You know that people delight in that sordid stuff. They remember that about you. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. You know what they'll do at a convenient time if, if uh, they have enough envy against you? They'll gladly tell anybody and everybody what you've done if they see that as an opportunity to justify themselves or extort you. Now, some would say... Confessing your sins to each other is biblical. And they'll cite some verses. We're going to look at them real quick. It's not biblical. Here are the verses. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5, and in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40, and some other places, what happens when a soul sins in the Old Testament is that he's supposed to confess that sin. All right, in Leviticus 5, 5, let me just give you an example here. Leviticus 5, 5. It shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. You know what those sins are? Those are sins that affect the congregation of Israel. And they had to be confessed before a Levitical priest so that he could offer the sacrifice God required for that sin. Well, our sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And he's already been sacrificed, and he already knows our sins, so there is no need now to confess that sin. You see, you're comparing something from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and things have certainly changed. In Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, you see an instance, an instance of confession. In Nehemiah chapter 9, in verse 2, 
the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Now, you know what that is? Those were sins of Israel, an entire nation against God, and they were confessed in order to get right with God. You see, you see it again in Nehemiah 1, 6 and Ezra 10, 1 and 11. But you know what? When Through Jesus Christ, we are right with God the moment that we get saved. Transgressions against God thereafter are not taken up publicly. They're taken up privately between God and the individual. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The only one who can do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't take it to a group. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 is a fabulous passage of scripture and it tells you to confess and forsake your sins. But to whom do you confess? The same person as in 1 John 1 9. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. What is confession? Is it just telling God the sin that you committed? No. It is agreeing with God that what he called sin is sin, and you acknowledge that it's sin in your life, and then you make up your mind, I ain't going that way anymore. You say, well, what about James 5.16? And I'll say this, James 5.16 doesn't tell you to confess your sins. It says confess your faults one to another. And faults are not sins. They can lead to sin. They can include sin. But in James chapter 5, verse 16, you know what's happening in the context? There's the prayer of faith being prayed to heal a fellow. And the confession of faults merely demonstrates that no man involved in the healing had the individual ability or power to heal the man because they all had faults. And so it attributes everything to God. So you see, there's no scriptural authority for confessing your sins to each other. This was something cooked up by psychologists or by the devil as a feel-good gimmick. It has no place in Christianity. So if you have a transgression, you confess it between you and God, unless it's a transgression that you have to uh, ask another person to forgive you. Otherwise, take it up with God and take it up with God alone. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.